What's going on? Now I can't get to my meeting. <laughs> People can hear me now. What is going on here? Uh, hang on a second. I can't get into my meeting for some reason. This is just uh, all kinds of fun here. Show video. Oh, that's why it's unminimized. Good Lord. Okay, full screen. Folks, I know you can hear me now because I'm on the stream. <laughs> just a second. Be patient here. Technical difficulties. Rookie, rookie program here. Here we go. Uh, there you go. Folks, hey, welcome back to Chris White Africa on the Adobe Africa channel. This is Chris coming to you live from Central Pennsylvania. And my guest today is also coming live from Central Pennsylvania, Representative Dawn Kiefer from Pennsylvania's 92nd Congressional District, we or Legislative District. We've had her on the program before, before the uh, event that took place at the beginning of November. You know the one that we're not allowed to talk about because YouTube will censor the channel. So let me just mention that event, which was... So there, you've experienced once again our self-censorship here on Chris White Africa, where we censor content related to the 2020. We won't be talking about that. Anyway, actually, we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Let me welcome in uh, uh, Representative Dawn Kiefer. And she's on the screen. Uh, there she is. Uh, Representative Kiefer, welcome back. Good morning. How are you doing, Chris? Well, let's see. After the technical challenges we had in the last 10 minutes, uh, I'm doing quite well. I'm quite excited to have you back. <laughs> First off, uh, let me let me say this. Um Pennsylvania has certified its election results, so let me extend my congratulations to you. Based on Pennsylvania's uh, reported results and certification, you've been reelected to the legislature. Thank you. Yeah, so congratulations on that. Now, the legislature is in recess now, correct? Correct. Okay. Not really recess. Uh, actually, we have ended. So our term ends on uh, at midnight on November 30th. And so that's been kind of the debacle here is that limbo period that we are in in December. So our Constitution says we shall convene by on the first Tuesday of um, January. OK, so some of our legal staff and our uh, leadership believes that, you know, we can't convene prior to that unless the governor calls us back. So it's that one month, almost one month of, of limbo that's there. Uh, there's other people with opinions that disagree with that. So technically, we don't have a legislature right now. You do uh, have a legis You do have representatives, but yeah, they cannot meet as a formal body and take action. Well, I hereby declare myself a representative for the ninety second congressional district. Then, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm the senator. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of which, listen, uh, I, I don't know how you feel. Uh, maybe you'll share with us. Maybe you won't today. But I must tell you this. There's a word in Afrikaans. It's hot full. And basically, that means I've had it up to here. I, I'm tired. So um, I've, I, I'm very strongly considering throwing my hat in the ring. Of course, I'll shave. Uh, but very strongly considering throwing my hat in the ring running for office now because I cannot stand this any longer. This is... Uh, this nonsense is beyond the pale. I still don't understand how Act 77 even came into the legislature and how it got approved by our legislature and it became the law of the land. And now we've seen it come into play in a disastrous fashion, at least from my perspective, for the 2020 situation. Uh, but I'm, I'm ready. So if, if you decide to move up to the seat, the rumors are that Scott uh, Perry will serve one more term and he'll be done. If, if you decide to run for that office or something, please give me the inside uh, scoop so I can run for your office. <laughs> okay. I have not heard that this is his last term, though. Well, maybe I can encourage him. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not there, sure I want to get that, the belly of that beast, but okay. <laughs> yeah. No, well, there's a Senate seat coming open. Uh, someone announced they're not going to run again. So there's a Senate seat in 2022 here in, in Pennsylvania. So I'm curious yeah. to see who runs for that, whether it be Wagner, Perry, somebody else. Uh, I don't know. We'll see who runs for that. But, uh, okay, so the legislature is not in session. You've ended your term, as you said. Now we got the correct language there. So... What now? I mean, um, obviously you you, you reelected, so you'll be back in January, right? I, I'll tell you. Uh, so I, you said you've had it up to here. I've had it up to here. Okay, well, and, no, and I've my, had it up to here then. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am. A, I, I can tell you, it's like twenty four seven a day trying to figure this out. I feel like I'm becoming a constitutional scholar myself, but. Um, many people have availed themselves to me that are constitutional scholars or constitutional attorneys uh, to try to navigate what this process is. And my frustration is this, is that we had an executive and a judiciary that violated our laws with or without Act 77. They violated them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm taking it from my constituent standpoint. So my York, my constituents from York and Cumberland counties in Pennsylvania were disenfranchised by voters in Philadelphia, Montgomery counties, Allegheny counties, who were uh, afforded the opportunity to fix a ballot, and they call that a curing of a curing, ballot. Curing. So if there was something wrong with it, they could call them. Not only did they just take it upon themselves to do it, but they received guidance from our Secretary of State. 
Uh, there were uh, counties that were not separating those votes. In fact, we had to get uh, Justice Alito to come in and tell Secretary Bukvar, hey, here's what it, we said that you had to do as far as segregating those that came in late, um, and you have to segregate them. She was telling counties to count them in. They were, uh, some people were allowing people to cast a vote normally if they came in with their mail-in ballot and they weren't doing it the same. It, there were so many inconsistencies across the board. Our, our state constitution says it shall be uniform throughout the Commonwealth, okay? That's our state constitution. And then there's equal access, right? So we didn't have the same access to the ballot that other other counties did. And some counties, quite frankly, it's called pre-canvassing. That means they open the ballots and prep them to be scanned. You were legally not allowed to do that. Yeah, that was against the law. Yeah, until, correct? Right. 7 a.m. on the day of the election. There were some that were doing it before, clearly, because they called uh, constituents to tell them to come in and fix their ballots. Mm -hmm. So you can break our laws and there's no consequences. I mean, I'm not an attorney and I don't know what the legal process is, you know, exactly how you have to word everything to go before the courts to have them take it. But clearly we can't, we wouldn't be able to get redress from our state Supreme Court because they rewrote our laws. They picked up the pen and rewrote our laws. They put things in there as far as signatures. Uh, you have people that did a mail-in ballot and people that voted in person were treated differently. You had to have a signature if you voted in person. You didn't if you were doing mail-in. So there was inequities across the board. We can't get redressed from the Supreme Court because they rewrote the laws, but we couldn't get the this U.S. Supreme Court to take up the case on an emer. I guess we tried to do an expedited, and they wouldn't take it up on an expedited, expedited yeah. premise. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you get redress? Well, that's how do we get? Let me interrupt you for just a second, so I can cover a few things, to make sure I'm straight here. Now, I first learned about some of these irregularities. I'll call them irregularities, but they're law breaking, is what it is. When I went to a meeting with voters, uh, and you were also present at that meeting, we were talking before the election, and I started reporting before the election that Pennsylvania was going to violate its own election law and likely its own constitution. Specifically, three points here that the state attorney general and uh, Josh Shapiro, and then uh, the secretary of state, I can never pronounce her surname, but the two of them, <laughs> what has it pronounced? Bukvar. 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 Well, that's not how I would have said it. So <laughs> anyway, anyway, but those two uh, Democrats, by the way, but uh, those two announced before the election in September that they were not going to require postmarks, that they were going to accept ballots after Election Day, and that the signature did not have to match the signature of the voter on file. And that's what you were getting at where they're not being treated equally. But those three statements alone violate the Act 77 itself, which was passed last year, if I'm not mistaken. So, so wait. That didn't violate Act 77. That oh. violated law as current our election code. And okay. it was not them. It was a, through a Supreme. They took us to court and the Supreme Court is the one. The state Supreme Court is who ruled that it could come in three days after. Did not have to have a signature. And I, what was the third one that you just said? Uh, um, post, postmark. But, 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 and the postmark. In doing with or so, in doing so, the the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overstepped its its authorized bounds. It is its job is to declare laws constitutional or not constitutional in accord with Pennsylvania's existing law, not to change laws. They changed the law whole cloth, did they not? They absolutely did. They rewrote. And then the last thing that they added in there uh, was we were challenged. They challenged us on the um, collection bo boxes, the ballot collection boxes. Our law does not provide for collection boxes. And what the st Supreme Court, state Supreme Court said was, well, we are going to deem the collection boxes a satellite election office. And therefore, yeah, that's what they did. This is An unsupervised, did. unattended satellite yes. office. Okay. So yeah. why have canvassing officials? Why not just let us all go to sheets or to ruck, rut, 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 rutters and just, you know, drop our ballots there? Come on. Come on, man. They had they had them all over, all over in uh, Chester County and, and Montgomery and Philadelphia. Now, my constituents in York and Cumberland did not have that same access. So we did not have this collection boxes. So, again, we were disenfranchised. We were not given. It was not free and equal. So what do we do about that? So I keep saying I keep challenging my leadership, saying I, I appreciate where we're at with the process. Right. But we're not going to get justice on this by waiting to come back in January. Right. And then say say, OK, well, let's look at it because this governor is never going to sign any changes, number one. And even if he vetoes it, we don't have an override. So so what then for the next four elections until we get another governor, it's going to be the Wild West. 
because you can break any law and there's no consequence. Well, there's absolutely no consequence. First off, this governor's, uh, as I did, I'm not a constitutional attorney, but I can read the Constitution. And I declared after he came with this nonsense lockdown restrictions, destroying our county here in York and others, crushing businesses, threatening us, calling us cowards in the face of an unseen enemy, as if he's ever put a uniform on or walked a beat as a cop or been a firefighter or first responder. Please piss off. Sorry for the language, Representative Keeper, but, but, but this guy has no respect for the law whatsoever. Uh, Judge Strickland in the Western District of Pennsylvania declared virtually everything he did in the lockdown to be unconstitutional in June. And it's now December, and he's laying down this nonsense again. Um, uh, our VFW uh, locally here was closed. Friday night was the last night. Now we can't go to the VFW and, and the American Legion and things like that. What? what and, and, and by the way, I'm sorry, I'm, I got diverged. By the way, um, two weeks to flatten the curve. Uh, okay. Uh, six weeks to stop the surge in the summertime. Uh, okay. Now it's almost a year, and we're back to wearing diapers on our faces and being told we can't go places by a governor who violates the U.S. Constitution and po- the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Constitution. You're right. We'll get no redress there. But the case you're talking about went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. They changed things. That was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the cowardly, callow fashion, a four to four court sent it back to Pennsylvania. Justice Alito gave specific, clear instructions telling the Pennsylvania, you can do this, but you must physically segregate the mail-in ballots in case there's a challenge to it. And I don't have evidence of this, but there are affidavits apparently that say that in Allegheny and in Philadelphia counties, they did not physically segregate those ballots. I don't know if that's true or not. You probably have a better view on it than I do. It's not because we had to, have a, we had to go in uh, and get an injunction from Justice Alito to, to set, basically send her a, hey, I told you not to do it. You know, you have to follow this order. But how many were counted in the interim? Mm. So- and in, in doing this, going through and talking with these constitutional scholars and attorneys, you know, what we have determined and following through, I have a group of about 30 of us who have been working on this nonstop, is that because they violated our law, right, it is, it therefore is an invalid election. That's it is I not, s- it is. An, I said that before the unlawful. election. I said it before yeah. the election. Because it's unlawful, therefore it's invalid. And, and because it's invalid, right, so the way it's been explained to me is we have this this supreme power, right? Uh, we are using the supremacy clause, right? It's it's uh, put into the hands of the of the state legislatures to facilitate elections. That's what the U.S. Constitution says. We took that power and we promulgated it through our statute and our our um, con- our state constitution. Okay, they violated those both of those documents. Therefore, we because they it was unlawful. We can take those powers back. We can use our plenary power to take those powers back, declare it unlawful and move forward with appointing our own electors. So that's what you've been hearing a lot of the talk at. Uh, okay. So what we were, the pushback we got from our leadership, because we put a, we put a um, resolution in to try to do this. Um, they said, well, the problem is we don't come back. So we don't even have enough time to vote this. Mm-hmm. And, and so that died out on the 30th. Now we're going back and um, talking to these scholars again. And they said, actually, your plenary power, if you were trying to exercise your rights, your U.S. constitutional rights. You can convene at any time. Yes, we can use our plenary power to convene. Now, their, their attorneys are telling them, no, they believe it doesn't exist and you can't do it. So we went forward now, we, we did another resolution that is just more directive. We go through, we delineate all the violations and we say we're coming back, you know, we're going to come back in the session. Doesn't even say how or any, we can convene this and go forward. Um, now that we lost that Texas lawsuit, I, I feel like it just, it was a punch in the gut on Friday night when Texas was going to sue basically all these states saying that it was unlawful and it disenfranchised Texas. Um, so I feel like that gave our leadership more. Um, it's going to just embolden them to stand, dig in and say, nope, look, we told you we don't have plenary power. And look, the courts are going to stick with this. We're going to lose. And we're not putting ourselves out on a limb to go do this when we know we're going to lose. I don't know that if we will win or lose. I don't know if we have 102 and 26 to get it through. But what I do know is I don't want to sit on the sidelines on my hands and not engage in the fight because I think we might not win. Yeah. That's not what I was rep- elected to do. And I think we have to go in there guns blazing. And if nothing else, like it's not about even overturning the election results. This is about justice. This is about 
free and fair elections. And we did not have that in Pennsylvania. And we've got an attorney general who's out there making all these statements who I think is that's incredulous, in my opinion. You should be recusing yourself from all this. You are on the ballot. He should resign, quite frankly. The day before yeah. the election, he publicly announced that Donald Trump will never win Pennsylvania. Excuse me? Uh, last I checked, you were my my attorney general as well, not just the folks who are voting for your side of the aisle. So to hear an attorney general who's challenging an election say that and his role as the attorney general, the day before the election is disgraceful. He'll never win it. And I guess he was right. He knew. He knew that Donald Trump would never win. It's strange how Donald Trump had a 730,000 vote lead when county ended on election night here in Pennsylvania, massive. He had 2.5 million votes last time. This time he was well beyond that, well over. It's just, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and then all these votes just keep pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. And and listen, here's the deal. Before this election, I mean, just it's not conspiracy, just telling you what actually is on the news. Before the election, I noticed about 10 days before the election, suddenly there was a lot of reporting on the fake stream, lame stream media networks, which I scan all of them, pay attention. Well, listen, uh, don't get too excited if Donald Trump has a big lead on election night because uh, Democrats have a two to one advantage for mail-in ballots across the country in the nine battleground states. Well, first off, Wisconsin didn't have mail-in ballots, so that was a lie. I called the media out on that one. That's one of the nine battleground states. It didn't have that process, only the federal absentee ballot. So that's the first lie. The second lie is that um, of those eight states, when it was reported actually by other news sources, four of them, Democrats did have the lead, but in only one of them, they were saying Democrats had a two to one lead. Only one state where there are twice as many registered Democrats as Republicans requested ballots, and that was Pennsylvania. So that's legitimate to say that 67% of the requested ballots, of the three million requested ballots, were by registered Democrats and about 32% by registered Republicans. That's the only state. But in order for, for Joe Biden to have won this election in Pennsylvania with those mail-in ballots, he would have had to get 84 to 87% of the mail-in ballots. Donald Trump had a 94% approval rating amongst registered Republicans. I find it highly implausible, if not unbelievable, that Joe Biden took half of the registered Republicans who mailed in their ballots. And Joe Biden took every single Democratic. We know that at least 20% of those who show up at Trump rallies are registered Democrats based on their, their uh, requesting tickets for the event. This entire thing, now there's no data there. This is just, this is just anecdotal information, but... All that aside, as I said before the election, I think we agree, this was an invalid election. And the only redress is a re-election, which I was arguing for on, on November 4th already. And we haven't had that. And and there's criteria, again, that to get a re-election, right? That is a whole litigious process that you have to go through. Um, but what's in my bailiwick, what I can do as a state representative is I can say that this was an unlawful and invalid election and keep charging forward with that. How that's remedied? I don't know. I think it's that we appoint our electors. But there are many, many just impossibilities and anomalies in what we see with the data, like you said, too. And one that we dug into and looked at, Frank Ryan, uh, who is a uh, retired Marine colonel, and he's uh, an accountant, mm -hmm. a forensic accountant. So he had some people, um, some contacts who are data analysts go through the, the, the own, our own Department of State's data in our from our um shore system it's called okay so we purged that data we saw that on november 2nd the state reported that there were 2.7 million mail-in ballots mailed okay so that's saying hey we got those we requested them they went out then on november 4th the day after election it said that almost 3.1 million mail-in ballots were mailed Here's why that's impossible, is that the last day to request a mail-in ballot was on October 27th, that is one week prior to the election, is what the last day that you are able to request a mail-in ballot. And the process of doing that has to go through the shore system to even process a mail-in ballot. So where did they get these 400,000 mail-in ballots as being mailed after 10 o'clock on election eve? I mean, that alone. And so there's so and that's just one example, which I think is a gross it demonstrates. We're only talking about 80,000 votes here. Right. Yep. So there's so many things in York County alone. Let me just say we registered since in 2016, York County, Pennsylvania. We won by 66,000 votes. Trump won York County, 66,000. Mm -hmm. We registered 13,000 more Republicans, additional. Yep. additional Republicans since 2016. Democrats lost 1,000, okay? Yeah. We only won by like 58,000 this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah You're yeah, not no, registered Republican to vote for Biden. Yeah, no, there's there's, there's no, that that's just, it's, 
it's it's absolutely insane. None of this stuff passes test. Uh, now you, I didn't go to Gettysburg. I wound up streaming it. This the, the, and and I actually caught you on there as as you you were brought in towards the end there. And I discovered something I didn't know. So I dutifully, like a good citizen, you know, showed up. And this, by the way, uh, Don, it's the first time I got to vote in person since 1988 because I was in the army and voting absentee all this time. So uh, I went, I went uh, to the to the polling station here nearby and at a local church, and I stood in line with people, many wearing masks and most not doing social distancing. <laughs> we were kind of close, but, but, uh, by the way, I didn't get COVID. I'm just letting you know, I didn't get COVID. So, um, I stayed there. I went in, I voted. It was a pretty quick process. I, I got handed a ballot and a Sharpie and you, I, in order to vote for you, it was on the back side of the ballot. So I voted for you. I don't know if it counted because when I colored it in, it just bled right through the page and everybody's doing it. I'm like, huh? And you're, you were on the back side, So I don't know how it, anyway. So I walked over to a machine. I put it in machine to count it. And I'm like, okay, there's a paper ballot. So there's, there's an audit trail. We can count the paper ballots. I didn't know that those machines were foreign produced and foreign owned. And the software in them was foreign until I heard you say that the machines in York County were from Dominion software. Did I hear you correctly? Yes. So uh, Dominion, they per they've been using Dominion equipment for years, but the new equipment we have where you scan it in the, the you know, paper ballot and you scan that was purchased by the, well, there's one commissioner that's still there, Doug Hoke, but that was, that was purchased by the outgoing commissioners. And so the incoming, which were, um, you know, Ron Smith and Julie Wheeler uh, who came in, you know, they were stuck with that equipment essentially because they didn't have the money to, purchase new equipment at that point. Um, and so I did ask a lot of different questions. I, I, in my heart of hearts, I believe York County, you know, ran a, and a fair election. I think that it was, I mean, they, they followed all the rules. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, you know, segregated their votes and, you know, they did what they needed to. If there were, if there was anything that went wrong, it was, it was pure, you know, human error or, you know, incompetence. Sure. It was not that. But, you know, it's not to say I don't know. I'm not a computer scientist, so I don't know what kind of algorithms are built into those equipment, into that machine. I asked uh, their, their person about it and um, he said, well, basically how it works, because he's, they were still in their one year training with Dominion. And um, so Dominion essentially teaches them how to operate their system. But it's not an open source system. So, for example, it's not like. Um, you know, Microsoft Excel, right? We can look and see what the formula is there. We know how to operate that. That's an open source software, something that we can all, we couldn't do that with Dominion, even if we wanted to, without going in and being some kind of a computer scientist to read what the code is there and how things work. Right, so, it's proprietary. That's part of the problem. Yeah, right. And the other thing is, is that these companies are private companies, right? So it's all private equity that's in these. And, and so you can't research that. It's not a publicly held company that you can say, oh, here are all the people on the board. Now we piecemealed some of that together, but collectively we can't figure that out. So we don't know who has an interest in all this, you know, all of the equipment. We've done a lot of research with Dominion and have a link to Smartmatic, but let's also be clear. The other equipment up that's out there, there's only four companies that are, are that mm -hmm. service 90% of the voters in this country, right? They're all, it's all incestuous. So Tom Ridge, when he was Homeland Security Secretary, right? Um, now he he votes for, it's uh, like Vote Smart or something, which is another uh, one of these equipment or software companies. And, you know, it's very incestuous. You've got these different li lobbyists. It's both sides of the aisles, people that leave Chief of Staff for Pelosi and then goes and works for, you know, lobbying for one of them or works on their board. It is not uh, transparent at all. And, and so people don't trust it, rightfully so. No, it's absolutely crazy. It's uh, so I, I'm with you. I, I, the officials here, I, I, had no, I had no reason to doubt that this was a legitimate election here. But it is highly suspicious with the enthusiasm here in York County for Donald Trump, especially after the last four years when this county, until, you know, the COVID hysteria and the scam that's been going on here, the political scam, not the virus, it's real. I mean, we're not denying the virus, it's a political scam though. Uh, until until that, I mean, just this county was blossoming, it was doing quite well, jobs were being created, lots of small businesses had started and done quite well. And then then the scandemic, but but with all that, uh, that, that enthusiasm for Trump, it, 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 at least, even if there have been cooked results somewhere, whether we know it or not, but he at least went from 62 million to 75 million votes. That's a 13 million vote gain for Trump. That kind of enthusiasm around the country and 
people in York County lost interest in Donald Trump and he won by a smaller margin and Democrats gained votes from a guy that can't string two sentences together that stayed in his basement the entire time, who was asked really penetrating and difficult questions by journalists like, uh, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, did you get chocolate or vanilla ice cream? Was, was, was that a waffle cone or a soft cone? Come on. Come on, man. What's your favorite kind of socks? What's your favorite kind of socks to wear, Mr. President? Good yeah. God. It's pathetic. Yeah, really the tough stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was really tough. And he's being asked tough questions. Now, by the way, uh, for those who don't know, for my audience overseas, but by the way, uh, Reps McKeever, we have a lot of Pennsylvanians who started watching my channel. That's kind of cool. So I don't know how many are in this district, but we've got them from all of the state. But but uh, for the folks uh, overseas, I don't know. There's no such thing as the office of the president of elect doesn't exist. So please, let me let me uh, I disabuse people of that notion. I'll declare myself the president-elect, and this will be the office, the president-elect right here, because it doesn't exist. But um, by the way, for the process, just, uh, and you can correct me if you, if there's something wrong here, but the process was the safe harbor date for states to send their certified election results in, in order to not risk losing their electoral votes was the 8th of December. The 14th, which is today, the electors meet. So in Harrisburg, the electors are meeting for this state to make their choice. And obviously, based on this result, it's going to give those 20 votes to Joe Biden. The 19th, I think, is the date that all the results must be sent to the Congress. And Congress meets on the 5th or 6th of January in a joint session. Until the fifth, the, the, that date, there is no president-elect. Uh, that's when the president-elect is declared when the joint session of Congress votes to confirm or reject the Electoral College results. Now, the Republicans still have the Senate. I don't think they have the courage to reject the results, but that's not an impossibility. <laughs> so. But even if they do, right, at the end of the day, because, I mean, we, we have given them rounds, right? We don't believe that ours are, are valid. So two, a couple things here. I, it's my understanding that, you know, um, the uh, Republican electors are meeting as well today. Mm -hmm. um, so they may be trying to, to cast a, a slate of votes as well. Um, how that works, I don't know. But we do know that we have sent a letter to Congress saying, hey, we believe these are these to be valid. We're asking you to challenge them. And that's all well and good. Congressman Perry has really been leading the charge in Pennsylvania, quite frankly, about all of the inequities and how invalid uh, this election is and how unlawful it was conducted. And so it will get to them. Right. And and so let's say he stands up. Then I've heard there's a senator or two that would stand up too and say uh, challenge the results for Pennsylvania. But then it goes to the vote and we don't have the majority in the House and, and, that, and we would lose that. Um, so it, it would be a great, you know, effort but at the end of the day we don't win that not in the not as our house is made up in in the united states so mm -hmm. there's nothing there now there's still a couple of lawsuits that are out there and we're still pushing ahead with ours uh our resolution it went out on friday night mm -hmm. um a second one that's uh we kind of reworked it actually it went out a second one went out on saturday because we reworked it after the texas suit um but we're still going to push forward with that you know win lose or, or not uh, we got to do it in the house, in my opinion. Well, I don't disagree with you. So in the last hour, it's been reported, and this is a story that's virtually buried in the news all around the country, Antrim County in the uh, up, up, upstate in Michigan, which is the county that Trump won handily, that was reported initially that Biden won it, and there was a 6,000 vote clerical error by a Republican canvasser. Anyway, um, that's a county where because of an odd result on a marijuana initiative, I wonder if YouTube's messing with my volume here because I keep hearing myself reverb. But but um, because a local resident was upset because there was like 264 to 264 result on approving in one local town, uh, allowing a, a marijuana dispensary to be in the town. He didn't want it. And it came out 262. So they did a recount. Three ballots were damaged. And so they couldn't feed them the machines. So they, they were spoiled. They took them out. And then the re-vote, re they won by one vote. How do you win by one vote when three votes disappear? And it was a tie. So because of that, he filed... Nothing to do with Trump. Filed, and the judge said, yes, uh, forensics go in there, and they sent f people up to get all the thumb drives, all the software from these Dominion systems that were used there. And apparently, um, that the, the judge, one of the caveats was that that information not to be shared with the public because it's explosive. Yeah. But, but, but the judge, an hour ago, said that it can be released. Now, the uh, of course, the Michigan State Attorney General's office, like, yeah, and they're already they're already trying to undermine this. Like, so here's what was said. Um, oops, hang on a second. It just I lost it. I want to read it to you. A quote for you. Eric Grill, an Assistant Attorney General representing Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, warned that the analysis is inaccurate, incomplete, and misleading. Hmm. hmm. Okay. <laughs> but it's your data. It's exactly. your data. And so in Pennsylvania, let me make this clear. In Pennsylvania, um, the reason we have all these 
uh, the new equipment. We had to buy all the new equipment and everything. It's because, first of all, Tom uh, Wolf unilaterally decertified all of our election equipment. We got sued by Jill Stein in, in the 2016 uh, because she said there was no way to audit our election. There was no paper trail. So therefore, instead of saying, hey, is there any kind of adaptation we can do with our equipment? No, we invalidate all of them. Everybody has to buy new equipment so that we have a paper trail. That's why we went away in York County from the touch screens to this whole, like, fill out the paper ballot, scan it. You have the copy of it. So we have a traceable trail. And what I don't understand is why the state GOP has not gone into some of these suspect precincts. It's a simple count. It takes three voters from that precinct and 50 bucks and say, I want a, I want a copy of every mail-in ballot and I want to see all the envelopes. Count all your mail-in ballots and count all your envelopes to see if they have, are signed. You know, they have the voter declaration on there. Do they, are they equal? Right? Do you, are they matching? That's your red flag right there. Because I'm going to guess they don't. Yeah. That's how they're entering more into the system than what actually exists. And see, that's I think that's the biggest uh, telling thing here. First off, it, it's kind of like the uh, you don't have to comment on this, but I, I'll share this. But it's kind of like the stupidity about well, it's voter suppression to require identification for voters. Is it really? Um, if you're white or black and you go or Hispanic or Asian and you go to Walgreens to get your medicine. Uh, you must show identification in order to collect uh, dangerous drugs. They don't just hand them over to anybody that says who they are. If you want to cash a check in a bank, you must show photo identification from government source. If the list goes on and on of all the things you want to do in life, you have to have a photo ID, but not to vote, not to vote. Right. Apparently that's voter suppression, but it isn't. So if, if you're an elderly black man and you need your meds, you can go to Walmart and get your meds with an ID card, but otherwise you can't get it. But if you want to vote, then, uh, so it's the same thing here. Well, what's- same thing with with all of your social services, right? right? You want housing? Not only do you have to have an ID, a, a picture ID, you have to have a birth certificate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But not for voting. Not for voting. Not this for is voting. crazy. No, this is absolutely insane. No, this this whole this whole thing is is just, I mean, off the charts, um, bizarre sort of situation here. Uh, I'm happy to take no no money and volunteer for York County to go count the ballots with a Democrat, with a Constitutional Party member, with a Green Party member. Every party that had a candidate election, sit there and count them and go through these things. I'm happy to do it. If it takes me three weeks, I'm happy to count them. And that's what puzzles yeah. me. I don't know what the law is. Are, are these ballots now secured somewhere in a courthouse? Are they are they evidence? Um, what is the chain of custody for? Because apparently now Delaware County the the chairman or chairwoman of the board of, of elections sent out a frantic email right after the election said we need people to come back because precincts walked off with the chain of custody documents, original voter rolls. And if that's true, then Delaware County cannot certify its election results. There were 400,000 ballots cast for president in Delaware County alone. Those ballots, the only remedy is to invalidate every single one of them because the chain of custody is broken. As a former federal law enforcement official, I can tell you that you can't trust those ballots. So, and that's the premise of, so Frank Ryan, uh, who I mentioned before with these uh, data analysts that came through, that was the premise of his. It was all on chain of custody and procedure and how that was not violated or how that was violated. And, and there was nothing that people were adhering to consistently across the, the, the board, across the state. And also in Montgomery County, it was one of their commissioners that was so angry. He refused to sign off on the certification of the elections for that county. Um, and, and went through it. He, he paid for public um, ads blasting the state and the county about this, uh, about the elections. How can they, how can they uh, verify the elections and, and certify them when uh, Montgomery County, he didn't certify there. So they didn't have the votes to certify in that county. So yes, now there is on, in the, in our statute, there is a period of time that they have to keep all ballots, mm -hmm. uh, the excess ballots, Every every paper ballot has to be saved for a period of time. And I don't know what that is without going back and looking at it. But there is a, a whole thing that's there. And uh, one last thing on the process, chain of command. So in York County, when they go, they will they deliver all of the stuff to the uh, judge of elections for for the voting. OK, so that would be all your bags and your ballots. And and you sign for that as a whole. You know, they, they're person to person deliver. They don't trust. You know, they're not sending it through the post office. And then when you return that to the courthouse, you have to drive it back to the courthouse that night. There is, again, a chain of, of, of custody. So you have to sign off it, you know, four USB sticks, but, you know, five locked bags, you know, this, this, this. You have to sign off a thing. So what I don't understand is how does a county say, oh, looky, we found another USB stick over here. Oh, look, we found this over here. If it's coming from one of the precincts, because the only way 
you know, you have to check that stuff in or if somebody comes and they say, hey, wait a minute, we had that you have five USB sticks. Where's the fifth one? Right. And then it should be all hands on deck until you secure that. How I don't understand how people are finding a USB stick on the floorboard of a car or laying in a corner somewhere. It's just it's all too suspicious. Well, for me, the whole thing is comes back to the original part of the conversation here is that what's the point of law? Why, why have laws? Yep. Why can't I just yep. drive 150 miles an hour to Gettysburg on, on, on Route 15? Because I feel like it. I mean, there's no point in having laws because, I mean, if the governor and the legislature, not the legislature, but the governor and the court can't be held to the law, which is which is, which is drafted and promulgated by the legislature and, and signed by a governor, if they just choose to willing, I mean, look at all the, the lockdown stuff that's unconstitutional and Wolf is just pushing on. He doesn't care. And and then yeah. with this election law, no postmark. Seriously? No. Why, why would we create a system? System when we have a federal absentee ballot system that's legitimate, it's proven, it's worked for decades for military overseas or out of the state on election and for U.S. diplomats who are out of the country during election and traveling business people. That system has worked effectively for decades. Uh, and now we're going to create this whole system of paper mail-in ballots and not have a postmark so anybody can drop it off anywhere and not have a signature. That's that's what I was getting at. So with the, like I was talking about the, dry, or the ID card for voting. How in the world can they make this argument and expect us to swallow this? Well, the reason that the, we don't require the signatures to match is because as people get older, their signature changes. Nonsense. Your signature doesn't change that significantly unless you intentionally change it. And if you intentionally change your signature, then you should have come back in and re-registered to vote so you have an updated. Uh, this is just, I mean, this is beyond the pale. I mean. Hey, Chris, one other thing that happened was that um, what we learned through this, and I had heard before, the, the Department of State had a contract with Rock the Vote. And they um, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. They it's worse. So I thought Rock the Vote was able to tap the system to purge like lists. But no, Rock the Vote had access to our state sure system to enter to register voters and enter data. No, I have a database prior to this. I, I worked with a lot of different grassroots. So I have a database. I don't let my volunteers or anybody that's ever worked for my company have access to change records. Like it, it is a specific, there are two of us that had that, the power to, to do that. You're letting this outside, this political entity enter data into our state system. And how is that not criminal? Exactly. I mean, sir, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's beyond the pale. I mean, oh, so you know what? I'll tell you what, I would like to go in and have access to the state motor vehicle uh, driver's license system. So I mean, cause, cause I want to, so I can just go in there and, and collect all and harvest all the data I want on my people and figure out what it is I need to figure out where people live so I can rob them. You know, uh, come on, come on, man. Come on, man. Jeez. This is insane. Well, it's, it's just rot. It's rot with, with, you know, it's just that it's been set up. It's, it's so ripe for fraud. But it, at the end of the day, it was unlawful, okay? so And I don't have to prove anything to you. Exactly. I've got this documented. It, I've documented what the acts that took place, right? They run counter to what our laws are on the books. And this is supposed to be checks and balances, right? So that's why you have a legislature and a court and you have the executive, right? We're all supposed to, but it's not working that way. It doesn't seem to matter what we do at the legislature legislative level, right? They can just thumb their nose and do whatever they want. Now you said, so the laws don't apply there, right? So why can't you drive a hundred miles per hour down the highway? Oh, because you have to follow. Yeah. You have to follow them, Chris. They don't, they're yeah. above it. And and you're too dumb to know any better. So they're going to tell you what you need to do for you, but, uh, and, and they'll take care of themselves. And that's, that's, so you, this, this is awful. And what it does for people, while some of them are mad and saying, I'll never vote for a Republican again. I'll never, you know, they're that disgusted. But you have a lot of people saying, I'll never vote again. Yeah. Because my vote doesn't matter. And that's the worst thing. That is like foot in the door socialism, right? That's exactly what they want. It is exactly is what they want. And there, there's two things I want to say about this. One was about a colleague at the War College right after this. I did a stream in which I posted about election fraud. And he, he and I put it in one of my WhatsApp groups, which he, I, I invited him in. And he comes in and says, what the hell? What's wrong with you? Why are you trying to disenfranchise me? I was like, excuse me? Disenfranchise? What are you talking about? And he went on this whole diatribe. And I said, all I'm telling you is what I said before the election. Pennsylvania's election is illegitimate. I said it before the election because they're going to violate law. They publicly announced they're going to violate the law. And by violating the law, they've invalidated all of our votes. I've been disenfranchised, as have you. But he was saying that because because he assumed I was angry because Joe Biden won. No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. It was about the fact that we've all been disenfranchised. And I said this before the election. 
And, and I stick to that. I, I don't change that because they violated the law and they need to be held accountable. And I, I don't, you know. And I fear, I fear when we have our gubernatorial election, right? In two years, when Pennsylvania has a gubernatorial election, right? And you have somebody like Shapiro who will be running, right? Mm -hmm. And he is going to be the one that will not investigate all the fraud that's taken place, right? He's dismissed it all out of hand already. How do, and we're, this is going to be our candidate and it's going to be up up for anyone's taking because they can do whatever they want. They can break as many laws as they want to make sure that they get their guy in there. And what are we going to do about it? It looks like nothing. Yeah. Well, and this breaking of law is taking place all over the country. For instance, uh, I, I didn't make any claims. I mean, you know, people came out with this nonsense, which is not helpful. The Department of Homeland Security put a sting in. All the states have watermarks on their ballots. I'm like, no, 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 no. Wait, first off, that's not even logistically possible. And then then also what I consider to be fraudulent, Chris Krebs comes out the day, two days after election. This was the most secure election in US history. Excuse me. Uh, you haven't done any forensics. You haven't, you haven't looked at any ballots. How can you possibly make such a ludicrous claim? By the way, this is the same jackass. Sorry for the language again, Don. The same jackass that's responsible for providing security for the cyber security for the U.S. government. And we now know that the, the, the Treasury Department and the Commerce Department have been hacked into for months. And of course, I know that none of this is secure because we know years ago that the Chinese and the Iranians and the Russians broke into 23 million top or intelligence dossiers from the Office of Personnel Management, put all of us at risk by divulging our personal information, and they have all that stuff. So, so now we know that this guy... Hey. Oh, gosh. You know. Oh, and that same, and Chris Krebs, right? And that same board that would look into the election, you know, how, the legitimacy of it and how everything took place, right? There's a board that's there. There's somebody from Dominion that sits on that board. That's insane. Were that they there insane. when you were coming up with your statement? So, and, and that, and that, um, um, CISA board too, there, he was just talking about, um, I think it was in, uh, any threats externally, like, were there any na national fair, or international? Fair enough, violence? but he didn't say that. He said oh, to the I public, agree. and that's, that was my and that was my point. I said that if he had come out and said that we have no evidence of foreign tampering in this election, it's secure from that standpoint, based right. on initial information, but you can't even make that determination until you've done a forensics investigation of the election Thank across you. the country three months after the election, which you have all the data in. So what a fraud. So this is the one thing I want to get to very quickly here before we get out of here is that, okay, so the media, the next day, uh, as the things start changing, people are like, what the heck is going on? Uh, then they start saying as the week progresses, well, there's no evidence of fraud. Well, as the evidence of fraud piles up overwhelmingly from thousands of affidavits from people who put their personal liberty at risk by lying, if they're lying on an affidavit, that's a felony, and they're violating federal election law. So that's double whammy. So thousands of affidavits, all kinds of stuff coming in. So they went from no fraud to uh, there's no evidence of widespread fraud. Then widespread. they went from that, from no evidence of widespread fraud. There's, well, there's not enough fraud to overturn the results. In Georgia with 13,000 votes out of 4 million. In Arizona with 9,000 out of 4 million. In Nevada with 30,000 out of 2 million. Come on, man. Get real. This is ridiculous. Utter ridiculous. But So they keep changing the narrative. And then what YouTube does is once the safe harbor dates reach, they have decided themselves that the election is over, even though the Electoral College hadn't even met yet. And now they're censoring people's content. And the media blackout on all this stuff. Nothing on Antrim. Nothing on this. And then before, before you get back in here, I not a conspiracy theorist at all, and I and I deal in facts, but I watched the video that was presented in the Georgia Senate hearing, and I, you know, here here's my problem. They could say all they want. Well, you know, you know, the 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 we didn't we didn't make them leave. They just left on their own. The media and all the observers just coincidentally left the 1025 because I guess they were going to five guys to get a burger, you know, if it's open in Georgia. So they all left at the same time. Okay, we'll accept that lie. But why is there a trolley brought out a table hours before? We didn't know it was there until we watched 14 hours of video or 13 hours of video. You see the, the 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 cases underneath, and then they want to argue, well, they weren't suitcases. Who cares? They were cases. They were secured cases under the table with a black cloth draped over it, left there. And by the way, the person who brought them out was not in the room watching the entire time. So chain of custody for those ballots yep. was broken right there. So every one of those ballots is invalid and should be excluded from us. And where is Brian Kemp, this feckless governor who barely beat this clown Stacey Abrams? Sorry, I'm getting very into political stuff here now. But who barely beat this clown Stacey Abrams Four years ago, <laughs> where is he at? Well, uh, I maybe 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 the uh, the Secretary of State should. What do you mean maybe? Order him. You're the governor. My God, call your set your legislature back in a session. This is this, this is scary. Listen, and that the, 
it, you're exactly right. And that, and that is my point. So when we're, when we are in power, right, we're at the helm here. We want to make sure, are we being fair? Well, I don't want to say that that might hurt their feelings. And really we can't. And that's what we keep doing. Listen, my leadership's doing it too, right? We always 110 ways to Tuesday of why we can't do it. The Democrats will take a millimeter worth of something they could maybe possibly do. And they'll run a marathon with it. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, my senator, Mike Regan, had the best analysis. He says, you know, the difference is, he goes, we're in a cage match, right? This is what it is. We're in a cage match, and it's to our death. The Democrats are just in it. They a strategy. We're going to, you know, we're coming out alive. The Republicans are sitting there going, well, what are the rules? How many water breaks do we get? Um, can we come from the right side of the cage, right? And it's to the death. And this is where we're at. We can't get out of our own damn way. This is a blood sport, and people need to wake up to that reality. The other side has, has been living in a blood sport for ages, and they don't care. They don't care. Yeah. The governors of states like Tom Wolf and Andrew Cuomo will suppress people's liberties to achieve their goals, to destroy businesses, to force people onto the dole, to make us dependent on the state and crush our morale. And they'll do it whether they violate the law or not. They don't care. And they'll lie about it. Yeah. Remember when Harry Reid, dingy Harry from Nevada, said that Mitt Romney, not thank God Mitt Romney wasn't president. It was probably actually better to have Barack Obama for another term. But, but Mitt Romney ran against him and he talked about, you know, he killed his dogs and all this other stuff and he did all these things. And and after the election, you know, Harry Reid got called on it because it was proven a lie. He goes, well, it worked, didn't it? Uh, that ought to be yeah. like a campaign ad for the De Republican National Committee every damn day. Well, it worked, didn't it? Yeah, and it worked, didn't it? Yep. And, and, that, and, then we'll, and you know what our, our defense is? Not fair. That's not fair. They don't play. And that's our response every stinking time. Like, we have got to do better. I mean, it, it, our response is just awful. It, it is just terrible. <laughs> It's very disturbing. And listen, I spent 36 and a half years supporting the defending Constitution. I gave up an awful lot. I mean, I'm not, don't cry for me, Argentina. But I mean, I, I lived in some really dodgy places and, 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 and served in combat repeatedly and, 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 and did without a lot in my life to support defend the Constitution because I take it that seriously. I didn't have to. I, mean, I didn't become wealthy from it. I did because I love this country and I believed in it. But, but I, I, I'm not saying I'm losing faith in America, but I've certainly lost faith in our system, our criminal justice system, in our legal yes. system, governors and mayors allowing people to be in, armed insurgents attacking our metropolitan centers, damaging, attacking, murdering people for wearing Trump hats. Um, you know, and then we have this self-declared autonomous zone out on the West Coast. Not a single person arrested for insurrection or tried for treason. How do you declare your own country inside the United States and not face any charges for it? What the hell is going on here? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. On the flip side of that, we're threatening businesses ten thousand dollars a day fine if they open up, right? So these guys are going to get hammered for open for God forbid opening up and exercising their rights, not doing anything illegal, right? Uh, but you're going to let those guys rape, pillage. A burn down and there's no consequences for it. it, it, it we've just at, lost our ever loving minds. No, absolutely. I, I think it's it's absolutely bizarre, and this is the reason why I'm 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 done. I'm 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 done with this nonsense, and I'm 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 ready to uh, stand up and 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 speak on this. Um, my former colleague there. Um, from the War College uh, has got a lot of attention on this, but I noticed that after the Gettysburg hearing, his personal Twitter account was blocked and shut down by Twitter. That's Doug Mastriano from the Pennsylvania Senate. So I haven't heard much from him lately. I think it's probably because of the media blackout. <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah, and again, even with him, they tried to do a smear job of, you know, off to the side. Oh, look, he got COVID because he's so reckless. And, and that's what they're trying to do, right? To just detract from the message on, on that whole thing. But, um, you know, you got a soldier through all of it. You got to be, have some thick skin and you got to keep pushing back on this. And, and you know what part of this is we've been kind of lazy as a conservative party in general, right? Mm -hmm. We've been sitting there letting things go. People are disengaged. They're not paying attention. And this has crept up on us and we keep letting them do all of this stuff and, and turning a blind eye to, oh, I don't like it, but okay, that's the way it is. Between, whether it's licensing and regulating or whatever it is, they keep keep suffocating us. It's one spoonful at a time, one spoon, and we're getting hammered and people are just waking up going, wait a minute, how are they allowed to do it? Well, we let it happen. Yeah. Well, I'll have to, in interest of full disclosure here, um, so that you know, I was a Republican young time in my life. I mentioned you before I was in college. I, I helped run a, a, a friend's uh, campaign to get elected city council. Young Republican, did all that stuff. Came in the Army. I was enlisted. I was Republican, faithful Republican voter, straight ticket almost all the time. Uh, and then I went back to college, and I decided that it was inappropriate as an officer to be a member of a political party so that people ask me. I wasn't. And so I wasn't a member of the Republican Party. Through the 90s, um, I was happily not a member of the Republican Party because this response you're 
talking about now is what I saw in the 1990s from Republicans. Very disappointed. The things they let Bill Clinton get away with uh, until Gingrich came along. And then, you know, so and then when then when Bush came in, the Republicans became, you know, like drunken sailors. They spent money like there was no tomorrow and they made stupid decisions. So, yeah, folks, if you're wondering about the audio, yeah, my audio is being distorted here. And, and um, this is odd that this is happening. But, you know, I'm not going to attribute something. But, yeah, it's you are hearing distortions. I hear it as well. But, uh, yeah, so I was a Republican. I only registered Republican because I, you know, maybe some aspirations running for office and you're not getting elected as independent. Uh, and I'd have to cut my, 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 my wrist in order to be a Democrat. That's just insane. So I registered Republican for that. And the other reason really is I wanted to vote in a primary and in order to vote in a primary, you have to be a party. And I want to vote for Donald Trump. So I did it. But, um, but uh, I'm with you that this Republican party, and it's not just rhinos that, you know, Republicans in name only it's, it's a lot of people in the Republican party. They just seem, you know, Mitch McConnell in the Senate, you know, he's getting all this credit for getting all these judicial appointments through, but he also sat on a lot of things that Trump was trying to get done early on. And Paul Ryan in the house. Oh my God, give me a break. I remember when that guy came up with the balanced budget uh, plan and I looked at it and it was 15 years before the federal budget was balanced. and was based on projections of growth so that more money was taken out of our pockets in the future. And that's how he balanced the budget and on the strength of that he became the speaker of the house and i'm like what is wrong with you people anyway sorry <laughs> but it's a blood sport but that, that, that institutionalism yeah. that's in there right? so it's it's those are the people that are there over and over again right and they're here we're going to feed you this and this is how things work and this is how we always do it and that's what we're up against there but you you have that and you're right it's not just democrats it is republicans too that are just kind of like this is the easy way this is how we do it uh go along to get along and i'll say let me give wolf one um Accolade here is I am a huge I, I hate licensing and I, I do not like regulations. I just think what we that just suffocates the middle class and, and it kills our entrepreneurialism that we have out there. Right. It's just to to try to squash competition. And um, he put a moratorium on any additional licensing. Hmm. And Republicans have on three different occasions uh, introduced legislation to license something new. And so we just licensed. Uh, pharmacy techs and these pharmacy techs are people that basically stock some stuff on the shelves. They can't even work outside of the supervision of a pharmacist, but we're going to license them. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. And then the other one that they did was, um, and, and he vetoed it. So thank you, Wolf, for vetoing this, but it was for home inspectors, right? And it's the largest purchase that the homeowner, you know, people will make in their lives as their homes. And you got to make sure it's like, no, it's buyer beware, right? And if you're a realtor, you're going to advise somebody to use this home inspector or not. You know, you should govern yourself. And if you're a terrible home inspector, you'll be your own demise. But it isn't something that, you know, the govern government needs to intervene on and do it. But we as Republicans, not only do we allow it to happen, we're in there playing this game. We are in there doing it because it's it's helping us with competition. We're, we're you know narrowing the field for our uh, competition. Let's keep these little guys out, and you know this guy this is a nuisance. So if they have to jump through one more hurdle, you know to to advance forward, that helps our bottom line. Well, see, now there's two things here before we wrap up here shortly. You've been very generous with your time today. I think we, we talked about 30 minutes, but you were you were really energetic and want to talk about this, not just me. So well, thank you for that. But but two things before we go on here. Number one is that I always found it puzzling when a member is running for Congress, uh, whether it's state or at the federal level, but especially federal level, I sponsored 37 bills. Oh, so you took 37 ways to take my liberty away. You're, you're proud of that. You're proud of that, really? Or and 23 of them are actually renaming post offices. But anyway, that's, you know, and then that's the one thing that always disturbed me. Uh, but it it sounds to me like you, you, I suspect we're probably uh, simpatico on this is that you probably don't measure your accomplishments in the legislature by laws that you use to impinge people's freedom, but ways you improve it. So when Trump came in office, one of the things he did on day one that got me on board, I voted for the guy in 2016, but I mean, you know, Hillary's a felon. I couldn't possibly vote for her. And yes, she's a felon. No one can dispute that. She has openly admitted that she violated the Espionage Act. Intent is not part of the statute. I'm a federal law enforcement official. I know the law. Anyway, so she's. I couldn't vote for Hillary, so I voted for him. But the day he came in, he just started wiping out this nonsensical executive orders that impinged on industry with these so-called environmental regulations that had no impact on improving the environment, things like that. All that wiped out. That, to me, is an accomplishment. He got He got, He got. got the government out of people's way, and look what happened. And that's, you know, I think that's something to be proud of. And the justice reform, look at all of the, uh, everything he did with the justice reform, right? We were getting bogged down with all of this little stuff that was there, you know, where people, you, you've paid your time, you've done, you know, you've paid your debt to society and we're going to keep hindering you and, and holding you down, right? Like when, at what point have, has their debt been paid, right? So he's helped with the justice reform, moving that forward, which is a huge break on our, our 
financially on us as well, right? So he's done a lot of that. Two, it was one in. If you want a new regulation, one in, two out. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tried that in Pennsylvania, and we haven't gotten anywhere with it. Well, I have actually I have the the federal or the state version uh, Reins Act, which is regulations in need of scrutiny from the Executive Act. Um, and it's basically saying any regulation that has a million dollar impact or greater has to go through the General Assembly before it can be adapted, uh, adopted. Well, um, that's a good plan because it through and it goes nowhere. that's a good plan because at the federal level, we've had people go to prison for violating Environmental Protection Agency rules, not laws, but because it was considered that they had the weight because the, the federal uh, legislature gave them so much authority, you could be put in prison for violating their rules. And, and of course, their rules are ridiculous. But uh, so I got a couple real quick super chats here. This is from Topsy Kretz, uh, who is in a neighboring uh, Pennsylvania uh, district. Uh, not 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 one of your constituents. I'm one of your constituents, but he's not. But uh, he gave a super chat and he said to the uh, the Colonel and Representative Kiefer for Governor and Lieutenant Governor in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> says with me on with me on their staff. Okay, he says please thank Representative Kiefer for her time on behalf of the tribe. He's talking about the Chris Wyatt tribe, and he said another way. He said as a registered Libertarian and Navy veteran, look, uh, he's okay, but he was in the Navy. We have to hold that against him. But as a registered Libertarian and a Navy veteran, I absolutely love Representative Kiefer's perspectives. Thank you. So, well, there's a vote. Um, but you know, here, listen. Um, you know, if we if we use Dominion, maybe we can count his vote into your tally. <laughs> sure, uh, anything. <laughs> Uh, no, it's, well, you know, my subscriber base is up over 20,000 now, but it's kind of lagged the last week. And I told people that I've, I've reached out to this Canadian company and they've guaranteed me that in January, I have 1.36 million subscribers, uh, uh, Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anyway, well, Representative Kiefer, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's really a pleasure. And thanks for jumping through hoops here as you and I were trying to sort out why the mic wasn't working. And, and my apologies for the deep state or the Chinese Communist Party or somebody listening to my conversation and disrupting my microphone for those who couldn't hear me clearly. But would you like to leave us any thoughts? Uh, people, oh, but before you do, I got a question. This is earlier. Somebody asked what that sculpture is behind you. I think over your left shoulder, it looks like, I don't know, like a clock or wheels or something. They're really impressed by that. So uh, it is a, and I didn't realize it was behind my shoulder. So my, if you move to the right of this, this is supposed to be my office, uh, but on the right side of me, it's Legoland. And uh, this is a wooden clock that my son built. It's all these little pieces. It's intricate and it has a little click, you know, the dial there yeah. and everything, but it's all hand built little wooden clock. And so they decorate all this stuff. I didn't even realize it was sitting there to you. Just said, what's over your shoulder? No, I have one amazing. And train engine and they, you know, they're very tactile kids. Uh, okay. Now, now someone's, you don't have to answer this question, but someone's asking how old your son is. I think because they want to be impressed if it's like a five-year-old or a 10-year-old or 15-year-old did that. <laughs> so this would be my 11-year-old son. That's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so so uh, I, I almost forgot that question. Somebody asked you earlier. So now that we've discussed the blood sport, uh, okay, um, with, is there anything you like, and we've talked about remedies. We don't know if there's a remedy, but um, uh, would you like to leave us with anything today? Um, any thoughts about what's going on or, or maybe the next legislative session since you'll be there? So I think, you know, everybody's got to be engaged, right? So, and I, what I keep saying is whether it's the shutdowns or whether this election uh, currently in the debacle we have. Elections have consequences. And so I, I appreciate that you're frustrated with the General Assembly. R remember, we are one of three branches, right? You have the executive and the judicial. Nobody comes out to vote in the judicial races. That's why we have a Supreme Court in Pennsylvania that's stacked, right? It's, it's five to two. Uh, it's the best money the unions have ever spent was on those seats. And, and then you have the Democrats have the governor's office too. So they have two of the three branches. So every time we try to take a step forward, um, either he vetoes it or if they, we are able to get it through, you know, they take us to court and we lose there every time. They are hacked. Now, we do have an impeachment bill for Justice Weck because of between the redistricting and what they just did on some of these shutdown things and their orders. Um, but, you know, you still got to get there. And I don't know that we'll have the two thirds we need in the Senate to to get, get through with that. So people got to be engaged, not just the presidential election, but every election. You've got to be engaged. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a great word. Uh, people people can't just, you know, show up. It's just the same thing in South Africa. People in the opposition are like, oh, what's the point of voting? That party's weak. You know, nothing we do change anything. 
And uh, in the last election, the, the ruling party got 10.5 million votes in the national elections last year, but 17 million South Africans who are eligible to vote didn't bother to vote. 17 million. So when opposition parties tell me, well, there's nothing we can do, bull, nonsense. Get off your duff. Get out there like the Republicans in York County did and registered 13,000 people in a county of 450, a county of 454,000 people. They registered 13,000 additional voters. The Democrats lost 1,000 on the rolls. It can be done. Um, now, that, that that's just an anecdotal point because obviously it looks like we, uh, based on the, the genuine true, by the way, uh, so YouTube, in case you're censoring, the genuine, accurate, true Pennsylvania election results, which have awarded the Electoral College votes to Joe Biden, Lunch Pail Joe, will be our guy. Anyway, thank you, Representative Kiefer. It's a pleasure to have you back on again. Uh, well, happy to have you on again. Maybe after the, the session gets started in January, get you back and tell us what craziness is happening in Harrisburg. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. All right. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry God bless. And thanks for fighting the good fight. It's a blood sport. I'm, I, I'm there with you. All right. Sounds good. Merry right. Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right, folks, that's Representative Dawn Kiefer from Pennsylvania's 92nd Congressional District. Let me take her off the screen there. And uh, there we go. Thanks a lot, Representative Kiefer. It's a pleasure having you on. Guys, um, a little bit of a choppiness with my microphone. I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, it may have been because of the mobile or something like that. But we had to go with her on her mobile phone because uh, she was having difficulty getting... Um, the microphone working on her on her laptop so we switched over to that so my apologies we were a couple minutes late on that but it was well worth the wait was it not wow she's a rock star man she is a rock star um when i was living in this area and people like you're gonna run for office i'm like yeah maybe i run for congress and then i i look to see who was in office i'm like oh there's a conservative republican and i start checking into what she was in favor of i'm like well damn it i can't run for that office i mean perfectly good representative there why would i run for that office anyway and she's fantastic so thanks a lot uh, representative Kiefer. it's a pleasure having you on and merry christmas to her and to her family and uh let's hope that we can somehow sort this out folks uh confidence in the system is is evaporating by the hour for many people so there you go. Anyway, so thanks a lot. Thank you all for your kind comments about this. I'll be back on here in a little over half an hour for President Cyril Ramaphosa's coal in your stocking, folks. There's my stockings right there. And Um Cyril is going to put coal in your stockings for Christmas. He is not going to give you treats in your well, what's going on with my camera? My camera is off. I got to adjust something here. But uh, he is going to give you nasty, nasty stuff in your stocking, folks. Nothing but coal in your stocking this year for Christmas. Uh, hold on to your hat, South Africa. It seems very likely, I'm not making predictions, but very likely that Ramaphosa is probably going to announce more lockdown uh, restrictions across South Africa as the holidays approach. And doesn't that just suck? That's right. Going to watch Squirrel losing his nuts, <laughs> says Erica. Yep. Chris, do you still believe voting is worth the time? I do, Lawrence. I absolutely do believe it's worth the time. But the problem is you have to have legitimate voting. When people can steal elections like they've been doing for decades in Chicago and in parts of New York City for years uh, and other places, then you have a problem. And this is not the first time this has happened. Uh, I still question the election results of the 2018 congressional outcome in which the Democrats, their blue wave, which was more like a blue puddle, in which they took control of the House was a consequence of fraud. I have no evidence of that. It seemed highly suspicious, the election results at that time. Um, Stacey, Ab Stacey Abrams, that vile, rude person, um, was almost the governor of Georgia. Come on. Anyway, anyway, so there you go. You should filter his voice to make it more bearable. <laughs> anyway, folks, uh, not going to say much in 35 minutes. Yeah, it'll be a lot of patting himself on the back. The ANC saved South Africa. They've saved the day with their brilliant leadership. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, but that'll be on 35 minutes, folks. Hopefully, we'll have a good-sized audience. Uh, and I thank everybody tuned in for this. I think we got close to 100 watching this stream after we got started. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate the support. Uh, we are desperate for attention here, uh, <laughs> trying to get subscribers as we lose subscribers by the minute and also YouTube under reports uh, viewing on the channel. So thanks a lot for that. Folks, I did a stream earlier today about um, the Rugby World Cup, the 2023 Rugby World Cup uh, pool draw. You can watch that on the channel. You've got this one. If you missed the start, you can go back and watch it. And then we'll have Ramaphosa on here shortly. So that's three streams, possibly four today. So we'll catch you a little bit later on. I'm going to watch it uh, on Ronaldo, says Lawrence. Okay, shame. That's fine. You're welcome to watch it there. Um, I think I'm more entertaining than Ronaldo. <laughs> anyway, uh, let him give more restrictions. It will just give the ANC less votes. Yeah, well, if people remember and if opposition parties get out and remind them, that's the bottom line. Um, what else? Um, <laughs> Trump is finished, says Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we get 
free money. Anyway, I don't know that Trump is finished. Uh, anyway, there you go, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in. And I'm going to be out of here in just a moment. I want to thank you all, and we'll catch you here in about 30 minutes. I'm going to grab something to snack on, and I'll be back up in 30 minutes. Ronaldo's already on, I think, right now, so I'm sure a lot of people go watch him. But don't forget, I'll be on, and my uh, biting, witty commentary will be here on Ramaphosa as he speaks. And unlike Americans and Frenchmen, uh, Ramaphosa pauses between his sentences so I can comment. <laughs> but when the French and the Americans are speaking, they don't take a breath, and I can't get the comment. In. Anyway, folks, here we go. All right, here we go. All right, see you guys in a little bit. Thank you for watching this stream, and thank you, Representative Kiefer.